Hodges had almost reached the main gate when he suddenly stopped. He stared down at the shears without comprehension. He opened and closed them with one sharp snapping movement, then slowly walked back towards the school. He entered the old building, and as he walked down the corridor, he caught sight through the open doorway to the playground of a black-gowned figure walking briskly towards the gymnasium. The stump of one arm at its side told him who it was. He followed. The boys had stopped halfway through the P.E. exercises, leaving Osborn, their burly physical training master, jumping on the spot alone, arms and legs snapping in, out, in, out. Osborn finally stopped his prancing and glared at the boys. Who told you to stop? He thundered at them. Well? The boys just stared. What's the game, Jenkins? He demanded of the blank-faced boy before him. The boy's lips moved, but no sound came from them. He pushed roughly past him to the next boy, one of his personal favourites. Come on, Clark, what's all this about, huh? Clark stared at the teacher as though he'd never seen him before. All right, all right, you've had your little prank, but I'm going to give you five seconds to get weaving again. He strode into the middle of them. One, two, three. He failed to notice Clark, now behind him, walked towards a cricket bat lying on one of the benches at the side of the gym. Clark picked up the bat and walked back with it towards the angry teacher. For this is your last chance. As his lips formed the word five, Clark raised the bat high and brought it crashing down on the back of Osmond's head. He sank to the ground, still conscious but painfully stunned. He sprawled forward as the bat landed again, blood now running down his neck, staining his blue tracksuit. The boys surged forward as one, stamping on the limp man with plimsolled feet. They pulled the tracksuit off, so Osmond was completely naked, then dragged him towards the wall bars. The bars were of the type that swung away from the wall when in use, so that climbing ropes hung from the tops of their frames. The boys lifted Osborne and viciously pushed him back against the bars, two climbing either side of him to loop the hanging ropes through the wooden bars and lashing his wrists to them high above his head. Then his feet were pushed through the lower rungs so that they were trapped by the ankles. While some spat, kicked, punched or just jeered at the hanging man, others ran towards the huge sports chest and brought out wicket stumps, skipping ropes, more bats. Then, in turn, they began to beat him with the wicket stumps, lashing him with the wooden ends of the skipping ropes, striking him with the bats. One of the stronger boys systematically hit at Osborne's kneecaps and private parts. The boys all bore the same animal look of madness on their faces, their eyes wide, their mouths slack and drooling, the insane excitement of their actions making them scarcely human, all except one. One small boy, crouched, shivering in a far corner, too terrified to run away, too paralyzed to take his eyes off the incredible scene taking place. A boy who had not been allowed to accompany the others on their coach trip the day before because he was recovering from an illness. Summers reached the gymnasium and paused. The pain in his head was becoming more severe. He opened the door and stopped again, this time with shock. The boys, most of them naked, were milling around something red and pink hanging from the wall bars. Then he realized it was Osborne, surely dead. He saw the damage they had done to the obscene-looking body, the beating they had dealt it. He saw the boys watching him, his boys. He suddenly felt a stirring in a region that had lain dormant for so many years. He shook his head jerkily, then a smile formed on his lips. He strode forward towards the silent boys. Yes, he said urgently. Yes, yes. Hodges went into the gymnasium, still holding the shears. There was no reaction on his face as his eyes fell upon the bizarre scene before him. 
Two men were tied to the wall bars on the far wall. One hung still and quiet, and the other squirmed and moaned, not with pain, but with the pleasure pain brought. Hodges slowly raised the shears. Yes, yes! Summers cried, his whole body now quivering with excitement. The boys watched in silence as the blades snapped together and the scream echoed around the gymnasium. Chapter 7 Homan reached the door of his flat, fumbling for the key, trying to calm himself, only too willing to appear foolish if Casey was perfectly all right. He opened the door, and a chill ran through him as he saw the place in darkness. Casey? Silence. He stepped into the bedroom and walked towards the bed. Only the harsh, dry chuckle he heard behind him saved his life. He whirled around at the sound, the movement causing the kitchen knife Casey was plunging down towards his back to miss. She stood before him, familiar, but a stranger. Her eyes were cold, her mouth was drawn back in a grimace. She plunged down once more with the knife, but this time Holman was ready. He stepped back and tried to grab her wrist, but missed. As the knife swept up again, he caught her arm and moved in towards her. Suddenly she brought her knee up full into his groin. He doubled up, his grip on her wrist weakening considerably. She pulled it free and sprang away from him. Now she knelt on the bed beside him as he gasped for air and raised the knife above her head again, holding it with both hands. The sight made him forget his pain, and he kicked out viciously, sending her crashing off the bed. The knife lay somewhere in the gloom. Homan couldn't see where. She leapt towards him, fingers clawing to tear at his eyes. They rolled over on the bed, their bodies becoming entangled in the bedclothes. They fell to the floor, taking the bedclothes with them, landing in a struggling heap. She dodged him and brought the bedside lamp crashing down towards his head. He fell back against the side of the bed, the restraint of not wanting to hurt her now completely gone from his mind. He would have to fight her as he would fight a man or a mad dog. He saw her grab for something on the floor and realized it must be the knife. Suddenly she ran forward, raising the knife high with a scream of anticipation. He ducked beneath the descending arm and was behind her. As she whirled, he reached the door, grabbed the handle and twisted his body to slam it shut behind him. He heard the thunk of the knife as it sank into the wood, then the thud of her body as it followed through and struck the door. He immediately pushed the door open again, all his strength behind the thrust, the whole action in one fluid movement. It slammed into the girl, knocking her back violently. She fell to the floor and lay there gasping. At the sight of her lying there, moaning, his rage vanished. He knelt beside her and cradled her in his arms, tenderly rocking her to and fro. Oh, Casey, I'm sorry, darling, he said softly, forgetting her madness, thinking only of the pain he had caused her. But even as he held her and her breathing became more even, he could feel her body stiffening, her whimpers becoming low murmurings of insane anger. Hastily he tied her hands with the rolled-up sheet, and then, without warning, her body went limp, and her eyes became glazed as though she were in a deep cataleptic trance. Lifting her gently, he took her over to the bed and laid her on it, propping her head up with two pillows. He sat there in the gloom, staring at the girl. How much had the gas, the fog, whatever it was, how much had it affected her? Would she ever be normal again? Would she try to kill herself as Spires had done? His only hope was that Casey had not been exposed too much. She'd been inside the car most of the time. Was such a short exposure still as lethal? He was still sitting there in the semi-darkness when the police pounded on the door ten minutes later. Homan went to the door quickly, afraid to leave Casey alone for too long. He was surprised to see the police. There were two, one uniformed, the other in plain clothes. John Owen, the man in plain clothes, asked brusquely. I'm Detective Inspector Barrow. We understand that you were the only witness present at uh, an accident at the Department of the Environment Building a short while ago. Detective glanced around the flat, visibly puzzled by the absence of daylight. Yes, that's right. My boss committed suicide, but 
Why did you leave? The detective was walking away from him, opening doors and looking in as he went, then... Hold him, Turner! The detective shouted over his shoulder, disappearing into the bedroom. A heavy hand clamped onto Homan's upper arm as he made towards the bedroom. You don't understand, Homan said angrily. We've got to get her to our hospital immediately. He wrenched his arm free and ran into the bedroom. He saw the detective sitting on the bed, untying Casey's hands. No, 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 wait! Don't release her! She's insane! You don't understand! He managed to gasp as the uniformed man caught him again. Oh, we understand all right, said the CID man, turning to eye him coolly. Your colleagues told us you hadn't been well. I don't give us any trouble, mate. I'm just in the mood for a bastard like you. He spoke quietly, but the menace was unmistakable. Homan realised there was nothing he could do for the moment. All right. All right, well, let's take it easy. But you've got to get her to a hospital, he said, trying to keep calm. I was in the earthquake in Wiltshire last week. There was a gas released. It affects the brain. It certainly affected yours, said the detective, helping the girl to her feet. I don't know what you've done to her, but look at her. Look at those eyes. No, 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 it wasn't me. It was the fog. Spires was caught up in it, too. It affects the brain. As far as we know, there have been no reports of gas doing any damage at the earthquake. But I was inside it, inside the eruption where the gas was. Yes, we heard about a man and a child being rescued. The kid's dead. We'll take your word for it that you were a man. But there's been no mention of anybody else being down there. They weren't down there. Homan fought hard to control his temper. This was later, at different times. All right, Sergeant, let's get him out of here. We've got plenty of time for questions. Wait a minute. There's something else. Homan resisted the strong arms of the policeman holding him. There was a busload of kids caught in the fog. It was a school uh, in Andover. You've got to find it, and quickly. God knows what's happened there by now. Homan impatiently drummed his fingers on the bare table in one of New Scotland Yard's many interview rooms. He'd been at the police headquarters for well over three hours now, wearily answering the same questions over and over again. Their disbelief was evident, and he realised that he couldn't blame them. He had been the only other person in the office when Spires had jumped, and they had been heard arguing beforehand. The police had discovered him with a bound and beaten girl in his flat. He'd only just been released from hospital after suffering a mental breakdown. The facts spoke for themselves. They had finally agreed to check on the schools in Andover. If there was some abnormality with the pupils, then maybe his story could begin to take on some credence. He looked up sharply as the door opened and two men walked in briskly. One was the detective who brought him in, and the other, an older, sterner-looking man, was Chief Superintendent Reeford. Reeford had tried to determine whether Homan was a dangerous lunatic or a clever liar, and so far he wasn't sure. We've been checking on the schools in Andover and found nothing. Homan's look of frustration was too natural to be forced. However, the Chief Superintendent went on, We've had a report of a serious fire in a school on the outskirts of the town. Apparently the fire was in a gymnasium adjoining the school, and there could have been thirty or so boys trapped inside. The survivors can't be questioned just yet. The name of the school was Creighton's. Homan frowned as he tried to remember. No, 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 I don't think that was it. I do remember the teacher only had one arm, but that's not much use to you. The chief superintendent studied Homan's face for a few moments and then said, All right, that was not the real name. The name is Redbrook House. Ring a bell? It sounds right, Homan said doubtfully. All right, Mr. Holman, said the policeman. We'll have to hold you a short time while we're making further investigations. But what about Casey? She'll need me. Miss Simmons will be well looked after. Where is she? At the moment, she's in the Middlesex Hospital under sedation. It seems she's still in a state of shock. But don't you see, that's because of the fog. It's a reaction to it. Whether it is or not, we'll soon find out. 
And tell me something, Mr. Homan. If this fog is drifting around the country sending people mad, why haven't we had reports of it? Why aren't all the people living in that part of the country raving lunatics? A slight edge of anger had appeared in the policeman's last question. There was an abrupt silence in the small room. Two pairs of eyes looked intently into Homan's, the two policemen waiting for his reply. Look, he said wearily, I just don't know. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. Maybe the Ministry of Defence can tell you. They've got military installations down on Salisbury Plain. They conduct experiments, dangerous experiments, in the interests of the nation. Maybe they've got some answers. Are you saying that the Ministry of Defence is responsible for this? That they release some sort of... Reefert paused. Some sort of nerve gas? Oh, for God's sake, I don't know. It's a possibility, though. If what you say is true, Mr. Homan, then we should know very shortly. And until we do, I'm afraid we have to hold you. Oh, OK, OK, but see that they look after Casey. She's got to be watched constantly. She'll be in safe hands, Mr. Homan. I can assure you of that. Chapter 8 Herbert Brown was worried about his pigeons. He drained his whiskey and stared at the empty glass for a moment. I should have been back before now, he said mournfully to the barman. I only took them down to Salisbury in the van, got some new ones, you see. Mustn't take them too far or they'll never find their way home. Some of the older ones are with them, so they should have been all right. And Claude never gets lost. Harry the barman had to hide a grin as he thought of the ridiculously named pigeon, which was Herbert's favourite. He'd had it for many years, a scruffy old bird that always looked as though it had just escaped from the clutches of a cat. To go on Sunday, Herbert continued, his words slurring slightly. Shall we back by now? Trouble is, you see, you'll need the sun to guide them. Herbert stood up, swaying slightly. I'm off, Harry. He weaved his way out. Once outside, he leaned against the wall for a minute or two. He'd taken that last drink too fast. It was the thought that his beloved birds might be waiting for him that had suddenly caused his haste. Herbert went across the road to his little fruit shop, opened the side door, then felt his way down the steps to the backyard, not bothering to turn on the lights. Unbolting the heavy back door, he stepped outside and listened. He heard the sound of cooing and looked up towards the roof. His pigeons, they'd come back, bless them. He went back inside and up to the landing window. He scrambled through it onto the flat roof. Now the cooing was louder and he could hear the sounds of movement inside the coop as the birds shuffled on their perches. He struggled with the latch on the door, then switched on the bicycle lamp hanging up inside the hut. The sudden light caused several of the birds to flutter around in panic. It's all right, darling, it's only me, I won't hurt you. Herbert closed the door behind him so that none of the pigeons could escape. He had to crouch low, for the sloping roof of the hut was not high enough to allow him to stand. He quickly checked over the birds and finally spotted Claude, perched high in the corner of the hut, not moving, but a gentle cooing coming from its throat. Hello, old Claude. What are you going to say to yourself, eh? He gently picked up the pigeon. The bird's beak shot forward and pecked at Herbert's bleary eye. He screamed out and fell back among the perches. The whole hut erupted into a whirlwind of screeching, fluttering bodies as the birds flew at him from all sides. He raised his arms to protect his face, but they pecked at his hands viciously, causing thin trickles of blood to run down them. The shock forced him to his feet, thrashing out violently, smashing the birds to the ground, crushing them with his feet as he staggered blindly towards the small doorway. But in the turmoil, in the confusion of flying bodies, he had lost all sense of direction and crashed into the side of the hut, knocking himself to the ground. As he lay there, arms outstretched, stunned by the fall, the pigeons flurried onto his heaving chest and continued their combined onslaught. He screamed aloud, shaking, shuddering, his entire body flailing his limbs and lumbered towards the small exit, still covered in 
feathered, tormenting bodies. Unable to see the torch, he sent it flying as he stumbled through the door, his brain, as well as his eyes, blind now. Moments later, he fell from the flat roof, his body hitting the concrete below with a squelching thud. Above him, on the roof of the coop, the pigeons had gathered. They gazed down at him and were still. The one called Claude cooed softly. Much earlier on that same day, Edward Smallwood had been fishing. He was a tall, nervous man, prematurely balding, and at the age of 35, still living with his parents. Both parents loved their gangling, stoop-shouldered boy in different ways, and they had guided him into his first and only job at the age of 16, a job in the bank where he had stayed and worked his way up to the position of assistant manager. He had not even felt disappointed when the manager had died two years before, and he had not been offered the appointment. Edward had never really hated anyone before that, but Norman Symes, the new bank manager, had aroused passions in him that had never even been tickled before. Symes' philosophy in life seemed to be, if each day I can bring a little unhappiness into the life of Edward Smallwood, then that day has not been in vain. Edward was well aware of how others on the staff enjoyed his discomfort in the presence of the manager, and so was Symes. That was half the trouble. The manager seemed to go out of his way to humiliate him in front of the others. Edward pushed back the bedclothes and groped for his glasses on the small bedside table. His day had already been ruined by the fog which had suddenly descended upon him while he was fishing on a remote bank of the River Avon at six o'clock that morning. Twice a week he cycled out to his favourite spot to fish and had found great pleasure in the quiet solitude of the river bank. It helped him to steel himself against the oncoming day. But that particular morning, it was only when he suddenly realised he could hardly see the end of his line that he became aware of the fog surrounding him. It had taken him a good ten minutes to find his way back to the main road. His mother was, as usual, overly sympathetic when he reached home and packed him off to bed for an extra hour's rest before he went off to work. Now he found his glasses and rubbed his eyes before putting them on, frowning with a headache that he had just become aware of. Later, the dull throbbing in his head increased as he walked through the town towards his branch of the Midland Bank. As he stepped off the curb, the beep of a car startled Edward into reality. He jumped back, his heels catching on the curb, and sat down heavily on the pavement, managing to cling to his briefcase. He heard the sniggers of passers-by as he sat there, his knees together, ankles far stretched, holding his briefcase in his lap. He stood up, brushing at the back of his trousers with his hand, a huge blush sweeping over his face to the top of his balding scalp. Damn them, he cursed inwardly, years of bitter resentment welling up inside him. Damn them for laughing. Damn the whole town. Damn the Midland Bank. Damn Syme. He saw a man ahead of him stoop to pat the upturned head of a friend's dog. Edward strode briskly up to him and gave the offered bottom a hearty kick. The man jumped up with an astonished yelp, the dog holding on to his hand with its teeth in fright. Edward marched on, ignoring the confused barking and shouting he'd left behind. A trader came out of his shop to see what the disturbance was about, and as Edward passed him, he whirled and dealt the inquisitive shopkeeper a swift kick to his seat. The man turned, using both hands to rub his smarting bottom, and stared after the retreating assistant bank manager, not quite sure what had happened. Edward made his way along the street, kicking bottoms at random. He rounded a corner and spotted the most enormous backside he'd ever seen trundling along ahead of him. It belonged to the proprietor of one of the costlier hotels in Ringwood, a pompous man and a perfectionist in his trade. The sharp blow to his rear startled him, and he turned quickly to discover the source of his rude surprise, and to his amazement found a tall, bespectacled man glaring challengingly into his face. 
The hotel proprietor half turned to trundle away, frightened by the gleam in the advancing Edward's eye. Get away! He spluttered, his fat legs increasing their pace, finally breaking into a lumbering run. Edward followed, dealing out more kicks to the large, wobbling target before him. They left a trail of bewildered onlookers behind them, who stared and then chuckled at one another in delight. Finally, the hotel proprietor saw a policeman emerging from a shop. Fortunately for Edward, he'd seen the policeman too, and had slowed down to a casual stroll. The fat man grabbed the policeman by the arm and was stabbing an agitated finger towards the now-passing assistant bank manager. That man! That man has been chasing me! The policeman calmly turned and looked down at the fat man tugging at his shirt sleeve and then at the passerby he was gesticulating towards. Uh, just a moment, sir. He called to Edward. Yes, officer? Edward walked calmly over to the two men, a faint look of surprise on his face. Uh, this man says you assaulted him, sir, the policeman said, almost apologetically. I beg your pardon, Edward replied, slightly indignant, not ruffled, but as though curious about the insinuation. He says you attacked him, sir. But officer, there must be some mistake, said Edward. I've never seen this man before. The policeman tried to calm the fat man who was hopping up and down behind him. He's kicked my bottom black and blue. Do something, constable. Kicked it? Oh, really, officer? Edward smiled benignly. I do have to be on my way or I'll be late for work. But, of course, if I can assist you in any way... Uh, just a moment, sir. The policeman turned to face the dismayed hotel proprietor. Have you any witnesses? Well, of course I have, yes, yes. The fat man pointed at the onlookers. Unfortunately, they only chuckled and shook their heads at the policeman. I see, the policeman said, putting away his notebook, a weary look on his face. But he did kick me, wailed the fat man. I did not, said Edward calmly. Well, I'm afraid, sir, there's nothing I can do unless you have witnesses, said the policeman. Now, why don't you go on about your business and let this gentleman go on about his... He ignored the outraged spluttering of the proprietor and turned back to Edward, speaking in a confidential tone. I'm sorry about this, sir. It often happens with these people. They see uniform and immediately use it to make themselves feel important. He's harmless enough. Oh, I quite understand, officer, said Edward with concern. It's quite all right, really. They want to be noticed, that's all. The policeman smiled. Certainly original, though, sir, saying you kicked his bottom all the way down the street. As the policeman turned and walked towards his car, Edward took two brisk steps after him, swung his foot back and gave him a hefty kick in the seat of the pants. Symes looked up at the clock on the wall for the fourth time that morning, half past ten, and still Smallwood had not shown. The scowling bank manager expected the telephone to ring at any moment and Smallwood's distraught mother to pour out excuses about the condition of her son's ill health as soon as he picked up the receiver. There was a light tap on the door, and his secretary poked her head through and said, Mr. Smallwood's in, Mr. Symes. I thought you might like to know. She smiled smugly. Symes looked up in surprise. It was usual for his assistant to be away, but very unusual for him to be late. Is he indeed? Well, I'd like to see him right away, Mrs. Platt. Seconds later, the door opened to reveal Smallwood standing outside. Come in, come in, don't just stand there, said Symes irritably. Why are you so late? Edward rubbed his forehead and said, I ran into a little trouble, sir. The little trouble had, in fact, amounted to being charged with a breach of the peace, a charge he would have to answer to in court next day. A kindly police sergeant who knew his parents had advised him to go and rest, knowing there was nothing malicious about him, but Edward hadn't gone home. He had something to do. Symes studied his assistant's face and sighed resignedly. All right, tell me later. Now, I've got an appointment at eleven, and I want to go down to the vault before I leave. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Peters brought in a large deposit for his restoration fund, and I don't want it lying around all day. I may not be back at all today. He picked up the vault keys, then a large envelope, and walked towards the door. Well, come along, man, I haven't got all day, he said to Edward impatiently. 
They descended the steps to the basement room that contained the vault, and Symes unlocked the heavy metal door. The vault itself stood at one end, fairly small, but large enough for a bank of this size. The bank manager walked towards it, and Edward followed. Symes swung the heavy metal door open and placed one foot inside the vault, reaching for a small black box marked the Reverend Dr. Anthony Peters. Edward stepped forward and pushed his employers back violently. Symes fell forward and the heavy door swung shut, leaving him in a frightening black void. Edward leaned his aching forehead against the cold metal. The air inside the vault would not last long certainly for not more than a night. He walked from the room, locking the door behind him, and climbed the stairs to the ground floor. Where's Mr. Symes? asked Mrs. Platt as he passed. Oh, he's... he's gone out for the day, answered Edward. He went out the back way to his car, said he was late. She went back to her typing. Then, um, Mrs. Platt, said Edward. She looked up at him. I'm going home now. I don't feel well. He walked away from her. I doubt if I'll be back. Chapter 9 It seems we may owe you an apology, Mr. Holman, said Reford, looking across at Holman. You mean you've had more news from the school? Indeed we have said Chief Inspector Reford. Homan sighed. Barrow had brought him up to Reford's office without saying a word. Both CID men had spent much of the night talking with various police stations around the Salisbury area in an effort to find out if any unusual incidents had occurred in their areas recently and if anyone had reported fog. The report from Andover concerning Red Brook House had spurred them into this activity. Well, tell me what's happened said Homan. From a class of 37, one boy managed to escape without any serious injury from the fire. Some of the bodies were naked and some of them had been mutilated, went on Reford. The boy says it started out as a normal P.E. lesson and then the boys turned on their sportsmaster and beat him unconscious. Then the other teacher, Summers, came in and they attacked him. Apparently, all the boys seem to have gone completely berserk, beating and, he paused, and mutilating each other. Is this boy insane? asked Herman. The doctors are sure he is not mad, and so are we. Why? Well, what makes you think so? Something that helps to confirm your story about the fog. Barrow spoke. He was ill on the day of the outing and didn't go. He sat at the back of the gymnasium, and luckily they took no notice of him. Homan asked, well, What happens now? We are trying to trace the whereabouts of the fog and asking if any strange things have been happening. There was a hatchet murder a few days ago. A man named Abbott chopped up a wealthy landowner, his wife and his two women staff, and then he cut his own wrists. And in the same area, a farmer was trampled to death by his cattle, and a vicar ran amuck in his church. We've asked for any further reports to be sent directly to us, and we are now trying to locate the fog. So what's your next move? We compile all the facts, and then I contact the commissioner, with a view to presenting the evidence to the Home Secretary. But the people should be cleared from the path of the fog, said Homan, dismayed. Well, first we have to find the fog, Mr. Homan, and then we have to make sure it's responsible for these outbreaks. Homan sprang to his feet. We can't sit around doing nothing, he shouted. I've told you my course of action, snapped Reford. Now please sit down and try to be a little bit more patient. I don't have much choice, do I, said Homan. Oh, very well. But now I want to go to the hospital to see Casey. Reford smiled kindly. I need you here, sir. Let me get Detective Inspector Barrow to ring the hospital and see how she is. The young detective disappeared from the room at a nod from Reford. Barrow returned a few moments later, a look of concern on his face. The hospital says that Miss Simmons was discharged a few hours ago in the care of her father. 
Apparently there was nothing they could do. Unfortunately, they could not prevent her from leaving because she seemed all right. The blue-green rover sped through the quiet streets towards Highgate, its three occupants grim and silent. Homan stared blankly out of a window, an empty, sick feeling in the pit of his stomach. Was Casey all right? Had the effects of the gas worn off? They turned left towards Hampstead, Homan peering through the window, anxiously looking for the house Casey and her father lived in. He tapped the driver's shoulder. Oh, that's it, he pointed. It was a large house set close to the road with a huge landscaped garden to the rear. Casey's father was a wealthy man with interests in many commercial enterprises. On the few occasions they'd met, they had taken a dislike to one another because both knew they were vying for the same person, Casey. Now, as Homan stared up at the dark windows of the house, he cursed the older man's stupidity in insisting Casey be released from the hospital so soon, if she had harmed herself. He pushed the unwelcome thoughts from his mind and got out of the car, followed by Barrow. Chapter 10 At that precise moment, just over a hundred miles away, Mavis Evers stood barefoot on Bournemouth Beach and contemplated suicide. She had driven through the night from London, fighting the tears that welled up, obscuring her vision, threatening to send her red mini crashing off the road. Ronnie had destroyed her. Ronnie had made her fall in love. Ronnie had made her lose her innocence. Why had her lover done this to her? After living together for two years, Ronnie had suddenly drifted away. Ronnie had fallen in love with someone else. A man. She had fallen in love with a man. The irony was that it had been Roddy who had seduced Mavis, introducing her to a kind of love she had never known, a private kind of love, the kind that can only be shared by two women. A love not acceptable to most, but more binding to those it touched because of its illicitness. Mavis had known Ronnie years before when they were both children living in Basingstoke. They'd seen little of one another in the subsequent years, Ronnie's parents having moved to London. Later, Ronnie had moved into a flat nearer to her job. They had always corresponded fitfully, and when, not long after her 21st birthday, Mavis decided London might be the place for her too, she contacted Ronnie. Her friend wrote back, suggesting she stayed with her, at least for a while. She was still basically the same sweet friend Mavis had known all those years ago, and they got on well. I've missed having a friend, Ronnie said one day. But I thought you had lots of friends here. Mavis's voice was hesitant. Oh, yes, I've lots of friends, but not a real friend like you, Ronnie replied. Mavis looked down. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be, Ronnie smiled. You're here now. Her hand rested on Mavis's shoulder and then began to travel down until it found the soft mound she was looking for. Mavis shivered as the palm closed over her breast. For two years since that night, Ronnie and Mavis had been happy living as lovers. Both regarded their intimacy as pure. But then, only two weeks ago, a change had come over Ronnie. It was rapid and alarming. Several nights she stayed out. Then last night, after being away for three days, she'd come back to the flat and brokenly told her friend that she'd fallen in love with a man and had allowed that man to make love to her. Mavis had crawled towards her, weeping, and tried to put her arms around her, but Ronnie had jumped up, knocking Mavis to the floor, screaming that she must never touch her again. That was when Mavis knew she had lost. Ronnie had walked to the door and left. Mavis remained in a heap on the floor, weeping bitter tears for quite a long time. Then she decided what she would do. Fighting back her tears, she went down to the little red mini they had bought between them and drove through the night to Bournemouth. And now Mavis walked towards the sea, leaving her shoes on the beach behind. The water chilled her with its coldness, but the chill in her spirit was greater. She found it difficult to breathe because of the combination of cold and the fear she had begun to feel. Death. Death was so absolute and the black sea around her was so frightening. 
she struggled to turn around, no longer wanting to die. She reached a point where the lapping water was only waist-deep and stopped to regain her breath. As her chest heaved, her eyes widened uncomprehendingly. There were hundreds, could it be thousands of people, climbing down the steps to the beach and walking towards her, towards the sea. The inhabitants and the holidaymakers of Bournemouth came from their homes, hotels and guest houses in their thousands and made for the sea. The fog that had ruined their day yesterday was killing them that morning. They walked into the sea to drown like lemmings, the people behind them climbing over the dead bodies that were heaping up on the sea bed. There was no pain, no thoughts of God, nothingness. She was dead. The fog rejected the sea and moved inland again as though searching for something.